Hello and welcome back to these videos on conducting technique and preparing for working with orchestras. My name is Alexander Shelley. I'm the music director of Canada's National Arts Centre Orchestra. Great to see you again. Uh, as you can see, I'm sitting at the piano now. I've moved away from conducting technique per se, and we're going to talk a little bit about preparing scores. Now, if you have to hand a score of Eine kleine Nachtmusik by Mozart, one of his most famous pieces, uh, please do get it out. If you don't have a score to hand, we're going to post a link uh, where you can access that score on IMSLP for free. Uh, I'd ask you now to download that score so you have it in front of you while I talk a little bit about preparing for a rehearsal and how, as a conductor, you need to think about preparing a score. I have the score here with me at the piano, and I'm going to focus only on the first page of this piece, so up to about measure 26, um, and talk about all the different areas of the piece that we as conductors need to have understood in just this one page. And you can extrapolate out from that everything else that you do. So, uh, of course, the first thing to realize is uh, who it's written for is just a string orchestra. Uh, as a conductor, you may at some point need to make a decision about the size of that string section. You can use uh, history books to read about the size of orchestras at the time. Uh, there were a lot of different size orchestras used in Mozart's time. He uh, was somebody who loved great sound, and he wrote about having big orchestra forces uh, at his disposal sometimes and loving it. But of course, many of his pieces were only performed with very small ensembles. So in fact, there's a lot uh, uh, that we can work with there. Ultimately, I would suggest it comes down to the space that you're going to be performing in, uh, deciding how many players you're going to need. And maybe for some of you, it'll also be a question of how many players you have at hand at your disposal at any given point. This piece, Eine kleine Nachtmusik, it works uh, even with a quintet. You could take a first, second violin, viola, cello, and a bass. It will work right up to a big string section. Some of the problems and the issues to deal with will be different between those two groups, and we can talk about those at a later stage. OK, so we start off in G major. <laughs> with one of the most famous motifs in music. And already within there, we have a four-bar phrase. It starts off in G major, and then the next two measures, so measure three and four, outline a D major seven. So we have a statement and a question, or a question or a statement. You definitely have two and two. One, that's two, two bars as a response. Now, already within uh, those four bars, you have questions as a conductor. Are we thinking of the first bar as the heavy bar? Going away in the second bar? Or are we thinking of the whole gesture as leading towards the last note? And the same applies, of course, in the third and fourth me measure. Do we think? Or do we think it's leading to the last note? And of course, there are many other options. It could lead to the downbeat of the second bar. It could lead to the downbeat of the fourth measure. But if we're doing our jobs correctly, we need to think about that. We need to think, how do we shape it? Bim, pop, pom, pop, 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 bim, or rom, ta, tom, ta, 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 dim, or something in between. It's useful to make that decision when you're preparing the score. So you have an idea in mind of how it needs to be. And then you can immediately, in the first rehearsal, indicate that. If it's yum, ta, dim, ta, 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 dim, or ram, ta, dim, ta, 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 dim, you can indicate, show the musicians. You could also have a response. You could have two bars of crescendo, two bars of diminuendo, or you could de decide to do it all exactly the same dynamic as a strong statement without any particular nuance or direction. But what we have is four bars of introduction. That's clear in your mind as an episode. Four bars, dim, da dim, da 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 dim, bom, ba bom, ba 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 bim. Introduction. And then we go into the theme which continues. And again here, if you look at the score in measure five, you have a few things you need to think about. We have in the violas and the celli basses, we have this repeated note, which will clash with the harmony above. You have to make the decision, is this going to be played consistently as or 
we're going to ask them to shape away from every uh, first note. So la ta 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 ta. Is it going to be wa pa 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 pa? Or we're going to go ra ta 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 ta. Are we going to have a shape? away to the middle of the bar and to the next downbeat. All of these things are important to think about. Do we want it to be wah, 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 or ra ta 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 or somewhere in between, like bum, 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 bum? These are all options, and any orchestra of any level will need to know from you, ultimately, when it comes to performance, how they should be performed. So think about the length, the articulation of the viola, celli, bass, uh, G naturals. Think about how they're going to shape them, and that'll be in relation to what you want to happen in the melody. Think also about the second violins. They have... <laughs> I can't play it fast enough. <laughs> they have that in the second violin uh, voice. How clear do you want it to be? Do you want that to be the voice of the seconds, violas, celli, basses that is the most leading, which means that for the audience you'll hear as a clear idea? Do you want it to be very bitey and staccato? Do you want it to be a little bit more detaché? Or slightly more fuzzy? That's an option too if you like it like that, that you hear bom, 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 and above it. Um, I personally would go for a degree of bite, so you hear the clarity in the second violins, but it's your choice. But either way, by the time we've got to bar five, you have to have thought about those elements, these key accompaniment elements. When we get to the tune itself, uh, you'll see that the violins have a broken chord. Those three notes, all on the downbeat as an eighth note. Do you want those spread? Do you yum? just as we have with the downbeat of the, f the, the first bar of the piece as well. You have to make a decision. Do we go to yum, ba bim, or do we split up the violin so that uh, a player plays two notes, another player plays two notes, and we hear the chord like this <coughs> as one, or <coughs> do we have it spread? This is, again, something that you need to have thought about when it comes to the first rehearsal, and you need to be able to give that information if it's asked of you. You also need to listen out for it because it's possible in the parts that the orchestra is using, they may have had something indicated that you don't want. But in the melody, we need to think about... Already here, are we shaping to the sixth measure, or are we shaping away from the sixth measure? So we could phrase to measure six, which would be this. Rum, or we phrase away from measure five. Rum, I exaggerate for the sake of uh, our purposes here. But you need to think about uh, the balance of these different bars, where the arrival point is and where the point is that you're moving away from. Of course, each of those downbeats has a natural emphasis to it and a natural schwung, if you will, that feels like uh, being in one. But when we get to bar nine, Again, it feels like a moment in the harmony and in the melody where it's a starting point that builds over two measures. So you may be presented in the first rehearsal uh, by one bar phrasing in the orchestra. And then two bars. And it's useful to bear in mind that in the phrase, naturally, there is this one bar emphasis, because it might be something that you want to ask the orchestra to try and avoid, this verticality on all the downbeats. Uh, if you want to avoid that, you can do it by indicating a more horizontal gesture using your right hand or your left hand. So lifting rather than dropping on that downbeat. It will help give the impression to the orchestra, ah, we're not going heavy on this downbeat, we're going to go slightly lighter. But you need to think about that. You need to think about five through to the end of measure 10, how you want it to be shaped. Then we get into uh, a little uh, transition. This music. Um, and of course, one of the first questions is going to be, how do you want the appoggiaturas to be performed in measure 12? Again, there are many different options. Um, you need to make a decision on that. Look ahead towards 16, where we have the figure repeated slightly differently, and Mozart writes out. <laughs> so he writes out the eighth notes. Um, one of the first and most obvious options to you is to say the appoggiaturas are simply eighth notes. In, that's in bar uh, 12. Here. Yeah. And so on and so forth. 
You could, of course, decide to do it quicker. You could decide to place them before the beat, which might sound a little bit strange. But these are decisions that you need to make. You need to also notice that in bar 12 itself, we have a little echo that comes in in the uh, violas and the cellos and the basses. So the bar before, the first seconds play. And in the next bar, the cellos and the basses go. It's nice just to be aware of that because is happening as a melody. You might want to bring out this little echo, which is there very obviously uh, to be seen on the page, but might be a nice nuance to bring out for the audience and the players. In measure 13, you need to decide about the lengths of the quarter notes that the cellos and the basses and the violas are going to be playing. Do you want this length? Or do you want... Remember that what they see on the page is quarter notes, quarter notes, and then in measure 14, suddenly they have two eighth notes. Again, this would be an argument for saying perhaps that the quarter notes should be a little bit more full. For example. Um, but that's something to put your mind to and to think about and have prepared in your mind. We have then a repeat at bar 15 of the same phrase, and then we go into the sforzandos at bar 18. Uh, in the middle of the bar, you see a piano printed. And again, as a conductor, you need to make a decision to help the musicians. Are we saying, <coughs> are we sustaining the G natural, um, the first sforzando and the second sforzando on the B natural, or are we going to diminuendo to the piano? So, or and anything else in between that. There's an almost an unending number of different options for how you uh, play that first sforzando. But again, the decision needs to be made in your mind because it's maybe one of the first questions that the violins ask you. Do you want or Hopefully, if you've made a clear decision in your mind, they won't need to ask because that's something you can indicate. Ta or T through those two gestures or any other gesture you choose, but something that clearly indicates sustain or clearly indicates release. These are, are gestures that the orchestra will be needing from you. Again, underneath those sforzandos, we have the running eighth notes of the violas and the celli. Do you want them phrased note by note? Do you want pa 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 or do you want pa 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 or ra pa 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 having started in G major. So he's already carried out his modulation for the second subject, which will happen on the next page, and we're not going to go into it. Because it's important to realize that not only if we had all these intricacies of the melody and the articulation and the accompaniment to think about, but there's also been a big structural move just in these few short bars from our basic key of G major uh, to, in bar 22, already arriving in D major for the second subject, which will come uh, just a couple of bars later at measure 28. So you have within uh, just this first page, you have a structural happening, the move from the home key of G major to the second subject key of D major. Um, you have a whole load of decisions to make about the articulation and the shaping of the phrasing. You also, of course, need to think about what forte means in this context. Um, how loud and how aggressive you want that sound to be. Do you want chiam pom pom pa 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 a little bit softer edged or cha ta 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 more marcato. You need to have in your ear already an idea of the way that sound should be. And that applies to the piano as well. Is this a piano with vibrato? Is it a, a piano without vibrato? Or is there nuance within that? Are there elements that you would like to have vibrated more or less? Are there particular fingerings that you would like to have included? Certain strings uh, on the different instruments, the string colors that you would like to have, going into another level of detail. These are all elements that you can think of and prepare. And finally, once you have all those ideas clear in your mind, think 
about ways that you can indicate them without having to talk about them. Find gestures to indicate the kind of forte that you want, the kind of articulation you want, the kind of sostenuto that you want, even the kind of sound you want. Uh, whether you want vibrato or non-vibrato, you can indicate all of these things. So I hope this was a useful introduction to how to break down and analyze even just one page of a score and that you can put that into practice with the ensembles that you're working with. I hope also that these videos have been uh, useful to you, that you've learned a little bit more about the basics of conducting technique and how to think about indicating phrasing, dynamics, everything else that's involved in conducting, and also this side of things, the analytical side. Please do subscribe to the NAC YouTube channel, also to my YouTube channel, Alexander Shelley, and visit the NAC website. We're always posting interesting new content for you to explore. I'm always delighted to hear feedback from you on the videos. If there's anything else you'd like me to talk about, if there are any pieces you'd like me to explore, or more elements of conducting technique that you'd like to hear from me about, then please do let us know, and we'll try to do our best to make new videos for you. For the moment, thank you so much for tuning in. And I look forward to meeting you all in person somewhere in the world one day.